In late 2014, when I was at the Pentagon, I received an email from a colleague who I'd met in New York City. In the email was a presentation developed by one of the top five audit firms. This presentation really showed a number of ways the Chinese Communist Party was attacking companies. I didn't stop feeling, you know, affection for the Chinese people or China, but I began to ask a question about the Chinese Communist Party, because before that I had never really studied the party. And so I started to read everything I could. And as I read about the Chinese Communist Party constitution, about unrestricted warfare, about document number nine, about the Tiananmen Papers, about the Xinjiang Papers later that came out, I began to understand the Chinese Communist Party is separate and distinct from China and the Chinese people. And most importantly, it represents a grave danger to the American people. It was two years in the making. The United States and China have entered a deep downward spiral. Where did it all begin? If you go by the mainstream media, it was Xi Jinping and Trump who plunged relations to their lowest point. Was it really so? On the China side, are the CCP's recent aggressions a product of Xi's personality or part of a larger scheme? What is the Chinese regime's long-term strategy towards the United States? What's the root cause of this US-China standoff? We have to get to the bottom of this. With the CCP insiders, we tracked down what really happened between the US and China over the past decades. The rise and fall of US-China relations. Behind this history, the Chinese Communist regime's 100-year agenda to defeat America. We talk about Chinese stuff. So what are the, Chinese? the Epic Times investigation team had studied the CCP for years. We thought we knew it inside out. But this time, what we uncovered was yielding evidence beyond our imagination. It would topple the entire knowledge system we had built around it, and most certainly shake the American people to the core. Our investigation begins from a confidant of Mao Zedong, founder of the Chinese Communist regime. Li Ray, born in 1917, was Mao's personal secretary in the 1950s. He was among the few more right-leaning communist revolutionaries. Li was thrown into prison by his party and spent eight years behind bars for his mild criticisms of the regime. Lee's diary and meeting notes, currently held by the Hoover Institute at Stanford University, provide a rare peek into the discussions at key moments in CCP history. The meeting notes start from 1948, about a year before the Communist Party established its regime in mainland China. Lee passed away in 2019. His daughter, Li Nanyang, who helped transcribe and annotate Li's writings, sat down with us. How would you explain this to people? After my father passed away, I started to organize his uh, meeting minutes. They always had the political study. That's a routine uh, inside of the CCP. And the high rank uh, officer always came over to talk about something. And my father uh, just recorded all this talk. And in this talk, I remembered uh, one uh, was from Yang Shangkun. Yang Shangkun, one of the most powerful early members of the CCP, fought for decades alongside Mao to create the regime. Yang directly oversaw the most important Communist Party affairs for two decades. In 1948, he was the party's top military leader. He said, Soon or later, we will liberate the entire China. Okay, and the next goal 
we are going to defeat America. We work together with Soviet Union. We become really strong. We have enough power to defeat the American and the West world and to liberate the entire world eventually. So I was really shocked even the, before they seized the power of China. When I tapped in, I, I thought it was a joke. I never thought it could become true now. I was really surprised when I read the well report. What Lee told us was shocking. It's hard to believe the CCP had such huge ambitions back in 1948. After all, the party was struggling to survive a civil war with the nationalists. It hadn't yet even taken over China. But after trolling through the CCP's internal policy records, we found that early on, when Mao first founded the communist regime, the party had lain down two basic strategic principles towards the United States. First, the United States is the ultimate enemy of the CCP. And defeating the United States is the only way for the party to achieve global domination. Second, defeating the United States is a long-term process and a protracted war. These strategic principles were hidden from the public but we managed to find their traces in the internal party meeting records, policy documents, and Mao Zedong's own words. They were leading directly to this ultimate goal. In 1949, the year the CCP seized power in China, Liu Dingyi, then head of the central CCP propaganda department, wrote in an article, the day will come when all mankind will sing a song of triumph over the American imperialists. That's a fact-based, scientific prediction. In Castaway Illusions, Prepare for Struggle, Mao says the slogan, Prepare for Struggle, is addressed to those who still cherish certain illusions about the relations between China and the imperialist countries, especially between China and the United States. In U.S. imperialism is a paper tiger, Mao says, When we say U.S. imperialism is a paper tiger, we are speaking in terms of strategy, and this tiger must die. We must continue to wage struggle against it, fight it with all our might, and that takes time. The 100-year goal that the CCP has to become the world's leader, which of course starts with dominating the United States is accelerated. So it's really important for Americans in particular to understand this is the plan. It has been being executed by the CCP for decades and well-intentioned American presidents and other leaders have been duped by that. It is terrible that the CCP has gotten so far along in this hundred year plan but they've gotten really close to succeeding. The agenda of the CCP, you have to understand, is the long game. They don't care if it takes 50 or 100 years to turn the world 100% communist under their control. So exactly when and how did the CCP's long game start? We need to go back to before the party was even ruling China. How jubilant was the taste of victory? The year was 1945. The world was celebrating the end of the Second World War. In China, the public was having warm feelings towards the United States like never before. In the hearts of the Chinese people, Americans fought for them. To the aid of China came volunteers from other lands. The memory was still fresh of a small group of American volunteer aviators, known as the Flying Tigers, who plummeted Japanese bombers to the earth in flames. The Japs that hoped to ride to world conquest on the back of the giant Chinese world. Though outnumbered by the Japanese, the Tigers never lost a single battle. 
During China's darkest moments in the war against the Japanese, these pilots were a symbol of heroism. As Time Magazine wrote, Flying Tigers swooped, let the Japanese have it. The CCP, relying on the U.S. to be the peacemaker between the party and the ruling nationalists, spared no effort to take advantage of the pro-American sentiment, and in doing so, prevented its own destruction. On July 3rd, 1943, the day before America's Independence Day, CCP mouthpiece Xinhua Daily published an editorial in a tone that would shock most communists today. Since a young age, we have thought of the U.S. as a lovable country. The Chinese people hold good impressions of the U.S. based on the democratic and open-minded character of its people. Just a few years later, Chinese communist soldiers were killing American troops in the Korean War. It was June 1950. The CCP, having taken over mainland China, painted Americans as the most evil imperialists in the world. To eliminate pro-U.S. sentiment in China after World War II, the Communist Party launched a massive propaganda campaign, teaching the Chinese people to, quote, hate, despise, and look down on the United States. America went from a democratic, civilized, and friendly nation to the world's most counter-revolutionary, barbaric, and aggressive imperialist country, and the sworn enemy of the Chinese people. In less than a decade, the CCP waged another war against the U.S., this time through an agent, the Vietnam War, a bad dream for America that never goes away. because I'm disappointed with America. Americans remember the anti-war campaign, but who was on the other side of the Vietnam War? The Vietnamese were just cannon fodder, and the Chinese Communist Party encouraged and supported the war. It was Mao Zedong who took 60% of China's revenue and forced the northern Vietnamese to fight the southern Vietnamese. And for what? To defeat American imperialism. The Chinese regime's long drawn out plans against America, an ultimate plan for world domination. This is nothing new to the U.S. intelligence community. In his 2014 book, The Hundred Year Marathon, former U.S. Defense Department senior official Michael Pillsbury revealed the following stories. In 1964, Soviet KGB spy Yuri Nisenko defected to the United States, bringing with him some of the most important intelligence about China. He reported that Mao sought dominance not only of the international communist system, but also of the entire world order. The real story was when I was 24 years old at the United Nations headquarters in the Secretariat. What the Russians there told me confirmed what Nosenko said, but they went even further. They said China has a grand plan that first they've squeezed the Soviet Union of everything they could get in terms of technology and investment, factories and so forth. Now they're going to switch over to you Americans, but at the time nobody believed this uh, Russian warning. In 1969, 24-year-old Pillsbury was working as an intelligence officer for the U.S. government. He was able to get access to thousands of pages of internal documents from the Soviet Union. The Soviet view of China in their internal secret documents, the American government got onto 
only because of a high-level spy who had a Minox camera and took 10,000 pages of photos, which the CIA assembled into a series of documents. In that material was a lot of description of Chinese ambitions and goals. In 1969, the judgment was again confirmed personally to Pillsbury by Arkady Shevchenko, a then Soviet Union official stationed in the United Nations. Shevchenko later became the highest ranking Soviet diplomat to defect to the United States. He told Pillsbury the Soviet leadership hated and feared the Chinese, believing that China was planning to take control of the communist world and eventually assert global dominance. The Chinese Communist Party, by its nature, was pro-communist, pro-Stalinist, and pro-Soviet. But Mao Zedong wanted more than that. He had huge ambitions to dominate the world and to be the leader of the world communist system. And he fell out with the Soviet Union when fighting for that leadership. After the battle, Soviet Russians considered launching nuclear strikes on major Chinese cities, including Beijing. Mao, by that time, through the ping pong uh, diplomatic uh, policy, and opened the door to reach their hand to the America. And the American people thought, oh, and then Mao now want to be a friend. Beijing's olive branch to the United States was unprecedented. And it came at a good time. The U.S. government was busy containing threats in the Soviet Union. In comparison, threats from communist China seemed trivial. Upon learning a deep division was forming between the Soviets and the Chinese regime, the U.S. did not hesitate to send then National Security Advisor Henry Kissinger on a secret trip to China. We seek an open world, a world in which no people, great or small, will live in angry isolation. Soon after, in 1972, President Nixon went on an official visit to China. His visit would fundamentally change the world order, where the United States and China became allies against the Soviet Union. We have unlocked the doors that for a quarter of a century stood between the United States and the People's Republic of China. And five years later, January 1st, 1979, the U.S. established diplomatic relations with the Chinese Communist regime. What Nixon did not realize was that he was setting the stage for a profound crisis one that could threaten the very foundations of America. The U.S. helped the CCP, and U.S. saved the CCP. At that time, Nixon made the decision to say that if the Soviet Union attacked China, the U.S. would have to step in and attack the Soviet Union. The Soviet Union was forced to pull back. Then Mao Zedong realized that if he didn't ally with the U.S., he couldn't survive he would be dead. So he was forced to be more pro-America. That's not the same as saying that he loved America in his heart, loved democracy. There was no such thing. The China card got the CCP what it wanted, a helping hand from the US. The only question is, would it stop Chinese leaders from seeing America as the ultimate enemy? That didn't happen. As Kissinger and Nixon were shaking hands with Mao Zedong, behind the scenes, 
the communist regime had a well thought out plan. Chinese American author Jian Ying Jia recalled in an article the party meticulously tuned down the anti US propaganda during Nixon's week long visit. But right after his departure, and even before Nixon's delegates had left China, CCTV was already airing anti US operas. Sifting through massive documents, we realized one thing. Be it Mao or successors to come, the CCP's hundred-year agenda has not changed since day one. To defeat the United States, become the world's top superpower, and establish a new world order dominated by the CCP by the 100th anniversary of the founding of the regime. Among the leaders after Mao, one man was arguably the most deceitful, Deng Xiaoping. After Mao died, the Cultural Revolution finished in China, economy just at the edge. Then Deng Xiaoping need something to save the CCP. He decided to open the door economically and open the door to the West country. And he visited the US and by his cowboy's hat. And the people just thought he was different from them all. Chinese leave today with their memories and perhaps a new image for communist China's leading man. For Deng Xiaoping not only went west, but went western. In response to U.S. journalists, this is how Deng phrased the U.S.-China relations. China is not important to the world because China is still very poor and has limited power. If we want to confront the Soviet Union, we have to depend on the United States. Deng's foreign policy in a nutshell, hide your strength and bide your time. For the American public, what they saw was an honest, low-key and practical leader a man who seemed to care more about the economy than political games. U.S. policymakers were thrilled at the idea that one day China would become a free market economy, or even better, a liberal democracy. America started sharing valuable resources with China. Technology, investment, education, military goods, and even intelligence. In the case of the media, from 1976 to 1997, when Deng passed away, he was featured at least seven times on the cover of Time magazine, fueled by America's excitement for this new Chinese leader. But America had no idea what it was about to encounter. On the surface, Deng did recognize the United States as the world's dominant power. Yet behind the veil of friendliness lied the CCP's staunch hostility, the rejection of American freedom from the very beginning. Anti-American propaganda was tuned down in China, but it never went away. Deng Xiaoping made it very, very clear. We would never follow the American way, no constitutional system, no political reform. For almost 20 years, the United States and China maintained a sort of peace. 
at least on the surface. That changed overnight with gunshots before dawn on June 4th, 1989, a day that shocked the world. A brutal massacre of Chinese students. The world is a much different place tonight. For the CCP, the Tiananmen Square massacre came at a heavy cost. It upended the honeymoon illusion that Deng had painstakingly weaved. And U.S.-China relations for the next decade would enter the Ice Age. I now call on the Chinese leadership publicly to avoid violence. It will not be the same under a brutal and repressive regime. Yet history came with another surprise. Mr. Gorbachev teared down this wall. The Berlin Wall collapsed. Eastern Europe abandoned communism. The Soviet Union fell. The International Communist Coalition on the verge of disintegration. In the eyes of the free world, the fall of communism was inevitable. But Deng Xiaoping saw something else. For him, the Soviet Union didn't fall apart because of the communist system. It fell apart because of foreign adversaries. Only person was different from them. He believed that China should change the communist system. That was Joseph. Only himself believed fundamentally wrong. The CCP was fundamentally wrong. The year was 2000. Deng's successor, Jiang Zemin, was setting off for his first official visit to the United States. This is his interview with CBS 60 Minutes, right before the trip. I'm convinced that this interview will be further promoting the friendship and the mutual understanding between our two peoples. You admire America. That's right. Jiang isn't just a successor of Deng, but also of his strategic principle, hiding your strength and biding your time. Be it the economy, technology, or international status, the Chinese regime once again needed the U.S. to give it a hand. During his visit, Jiang was as flattering as a communist could possibly be to America. But his smiles came with a warning. Behind America's back, Jiang fiercely attacked those who sought democratic reforms in China and fanned up anti-U.S. sentiment across the country. In a society where large-scale protests are heavily regulated even today, how were the protests against America so widespread and well-publicized? The sentiments became most prominent in the wake of a tragic event. September 11th, 2001. Yeah, the Trade Center's down. It's down. It's down. when the American people were grieving their loss. Some Chinese netizens, brainwashed by the party, cheered for America's suffering. So, is Jiang Zemin pro-America or anti-America? The documents we uncovered revealed one of the party's most closely guarded secrets on how Jiang came to power. In the aftermath of the Tiananmen Square massacre, Deng, worried he would eventually pay for his killings, laid his eyes on Jiang as a successor. The reason? Jiang was among those who had ordered the troops to open fire. As the biggest political beneficiary of the massacre, Jiang pushed China to its darkest era of human rights. 
He also embodied the dual nature of Beijing's foreign policy to its fullest extent, appearing pro-American on the outside and anti-American on the inside. But America once again overlooked the CCP's ambition. I believe that the United States and China can accomplish a lot when we work together to fight terrorism. The same year, Jiang ratcheted up the budget to purchase Russian weapons. A 2021 report from the Congressional Research Service found that in 2001, Russian arms exports to China exceeded $2.5 billion. That accounts for half of all Russian arms exports. China became the world's largest arms importer. Why did Jiang put so much effort into developing the Chinese military? In a 2004 congressional hearing, University of Pennsylvania professor and China expert Arthur Waldron warned lawmakers. The new Chinese military is the only one being developed anywhere in the world today that is specifically configured to fight the United States of America. Jiang wasn't just using Chinese troops. He was building a global alliance against the United States exporting advanced weapons to other authoritarian regimes and terrorist groups. In 2001, he established the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, a regional alliance directly aimed to counter the U.S.-led NATO. China started exporting increasing amounts of missile technology to Iran. And the Iranians began trading that with the North Koreans. Then there was the direct export of missile technology to Pakistan, uh, enabling the Pakistanis to make a family of uh, solid fuel ballistic missiles from artillery rockets to intermediate range ballistic missiles. All of that technology is traded between the North Koreans, the uh, Pakistanis, and, and the Iranians. It's all Chinese technology. The Chinese regime's plan stretched even further. During Jiang's term, an online survey led by the Chinese military shocked the world. It began with Shi Haotian, the Chinese operational commander who directed the murder of protesters during the Tiananmen Massacre. Xi served as vice chairman of the CCP's Central Military Commission and defense minister. In 2004, after he had just left office, Xi commissioned Chinese media Sina to conduct an online survey. In it, one question went, if you were a soldier, would you open fire on women, children, and prisoners of war with the permission of your superiors? 34% of the respondents chose, I would shoot under any circumstances. Another 48.6% chose, I would shoot only if my life or the lives of my fellow soldiers were in danger. Only 3.8% would not shoot women, children, and prisoners of war under any circumstances. Why would the Chinese military conduct a survey like this? In an internal speech in 2005, Chi Haotian gave the answer. In short, our online survey is to find out whether the people would rise against us if one day we decide to get our hands dirty and secretly clean up America. Will the people be more for or against it? Our basic judgment is that if the people are in favor of opening fire on women and children, they'll be in favor of cleaning up the United States. Due to overwhelming social pushback, however, the Communist Party quickly removed information about the survey from the internet. I had a friend. We were the same generation. And when I went back to China, we had dinner together. 
and she asked me, why you American always want to defeat us? I said, no, no such thing. America never tried to uh, destroy China. There's no such thing. She said, no, you are brainwashed by the American <laughs> government. So I just realized because we live in the different worlds. In a world like communist China in the 2000s, military buildup and anti-American sentiment raged on, even during the term of Jiang's successor. As mild-mannered as Hu Jintao seems, the smell of gunpowder was still in the air. It may be hard for us in the free world to believe, but a regime change in the communist playbook is hardly ever a real transfer of power. During his 10 years as the CCP's top leader, who was just a puppet of the old guard, and the CCP's hatred towards America remained hidden in plain sight. Things started to change in 2012, when Xi Jinping took power. For the first time in almost 30 years, the party altered the face of its anti-US strategy. It was 2010, when China surpassed Japan to become the world's second largest economy. On the other side of the world, the United States was still recovering from the storm of the 2008 financial crisis. Lehman Brothers, a 158-year-old firm, filed for bankruptcy. The speed with which we are watching this market deteriorate. Month-to-month -month drop in existing home sales since they started keeping track in the late 90s. The economic power balance between China and the United States was changing. The U.S. is going downhill and China is going to replace it. Narratives like this started to make headlines in Chinese state media, even making their way into Western mainstream media and scholarly works. The CCP has entered a new stage to challenge the existing world order. Beijing realized it was time to phase out the old strategy. There was no need for hiding your strength and biding your time anymore. Instead, we're starting to hear phrases like, realize the Chinese dream, the great rejuvenation of the Chinese nation, and building a community of shared human destiny. But do we really understand the true meaning behind the China dream? and the great revival of China. You have to understand the propaganda skill of the CCP. Actually, behind the dream is the CCP's agenda. What is the so-called Chinese dream? Is it the dream of China, this country, or the dream of the CCP? It is, of course, not the dream of this country. because the country means its population. It's simply the dream of CCP, covered with the flag of China. Chinese Supreme Leader Xi Jinping has declared uh, that China is seeking the China dream. I call it the China nightmare. This is a vision of China dominating the world. This is the opening of Silent Contest, a propaganda film produced by the CCP's People's Liberation Army in 2013. The message was shocking. China's great ascension will always go hand in hand with our fight against American hegemony. This is a 100 year battle that won't be swayed by human will. but there were new warning signs ahead. In 2015, Xi Jinping proposed the Belt and Road Initiative, building infrastructure for developing countries across continents in exchange for influence and control over them. 
Meanwhile, Beijing starts to expand its military presence around the world, openly compete with the U.S. on the technological front. Artificial intelligence arms race between the two countries. Develop central bank-backed digital currency to vanquish U.S. financial control. First major economy to create its own digital currency. What is Beijing's end game? As well as take over international organizations, one vote at a time. The regime was many steps into its goal of expansion until Trump's trade war. Game on here. A trade war between the United States and China is here. It's real at the stroke of midnight. China is imposing new tariffs on U.S. goods today after President Trump put tariffs on $200 billion worth of Chinese imports. What happened in 2018 was the first major setback the CCP met on its way. It also officially marked an end to the strategic partnership of U.S.-China relations. The CCP's so-called economic miracle was much indebted to U.S. investment and assistance. But it didn't hesitate to openly fall out with America in the trade war. Was the clash purely the result of trade disputes? Or was there something deeper? The CCP's path of economic development is not a normal one, and it is not a normal one that is willing to accomplish its development through normal competition. For example, the world's intellectual property industry stipulates that you cannot steal the intellectual property of other countries. And the CCP is thinking, if I don't steal property rights, I can't develop. If you don't let me steal, I should rob. Not just technologies, but also resources. The Chinese economy is now highly dependent on external resources. It knows very well that there is only one way, hegemony. And the first obstacle to hegemony in this era is the United States. America and the free world are at an inflection point. China's stealth war is now entering its third decade. Its goal of becoming the dominant power by 2049, 100 years after the Chinese Communist Party took control of China, is within shooting distance. America and the global economy have been complicit, sometimes unknowingly, in the rise of power of the Chinese Communist Party. The good news is that now with Xi Jinping, the Chinese Communist Party is no longer hiding in plain sight. Chi 用泄肉铸成的钢铁长城面前，碰的头破血流。当今世界正经历百年未有之大变局，突如其来的新冠肺炎疫情，对全世界是一次严峻考验。Great changes unseen in a century. A slogan that Xi Jinping first coined in 2017 became a political buzzword in the CCP, especially in 2020. For the communist regime, the timing of how the global pandemic began wouldn't have been more perfect. It was a devastating blow to the entire world. We've all witnessed how the CCP turned the initial cover-up of the virus in its favor a chance to weaken the free world that had always prevailed, and to set off a World War III to reset the world order. On July 1st, 2021, when the CCP celebrated the 100 years of its founding, the great rejuvenation of the Chinese nation was mentioned 21 times. There was no mention of who the foreign enemy is, but it's no longer a secret. 
The party's anniversaries are usually coupled with the release of jingoistic war epics. This time, the party chose to focus on the only war that Chinese troops fought head to head with American soldiers, the Korean War. In it, well-equipped but overly confident U.S. troops were portrayed as aggressors who suffered defeat by heroic Chinese Communist Party soldiers who survived on raw potatoes. In the post-pandemic age, the CCP's plot against the United States has become an open book. Yet for those of us living in America, there's more to the story than we were capable of seeing before. China's foreign ministry has been accusing the U.S. of increasing tensions with Russia and hyping up the possibility of war. What is causing the fundamental division between the U.S. and China? Why have party leaders been so consistent in carrying out this century-old agenda? Why advocate for America's demise? Remember, the United States has been the economic engine for the world economy for the past 70 years. So they want to take that over and to control that for the, the benefit of the Communist Party. America is the only force on the planet that can bring them down. They know that if they're going to be victorious, they have to destroy the shining example of liberty on this planet. The only country that confront them, can confront them spiritually, philosophically, economically, militarily. The only opposition they really have. They often refer to warring states and the tactics of the warring states period. And one of those tactics was a kind of uh, win or lose, I win you lose, zero sum game. Only one country got to lead the world. And that country had to destroy the others or set them against each other or undermine them, steal their technology. There are a variety of techniques that were used. One thing has never changed about the Chinese Communist Party. From Mao to Xi Jinping, there's not a single one who didn't stress that he is a member of the Communist Party. What is a Communist Party? The Communist Party is a political force that wants to overthrow the existing order of the world, to take over the world, to control the world. Therefore, as long as it is a Communist Party, no matter how many leaders it changes, it will not change its nature. Fundamentally, there's a, there's a, a problem if, with, with Communist ideology is that uh, it, it views everything else as a rival. Uh, there is a, a xenophobia about global dominance, and if there's going to be global dominance, it can only be by one power. So the United States should never dream of being a so-called friend, friendly relationship. There's no way to reach that. Because in front of you, in front of the United States, it's a tiger. He wants to eat you. Like myself. Americans are witnessing how an old friend of nearly 50 years tore off its mask and finally revealed the face of a cold-blooded killer. We cannot help but ask, what did the U.S. government get wrong about the Chinese Communist Party? How did U.S. policy fail? What price must we pay for this failure? And how exactly did the CCP do it? How did they deceive the sky? <laughs>